Caroline MacArthur, and I'm going to share this today's announcements with you. The first announcement is about the Lenten Congregational Devotion Booklet. It's time for you to select your scripture to read and pray on and add to the devotion booklet. There are scriptures available in the church office where you can reach out, call, email, stop by, and you will see a list of scriptures that you can select and to be added to this booklet. It's a really rewarding experience. I've done it, and it's a very rewarding experience to read and follow along with the booklet, so I really encourage you to contact the church for that. The congregational meeting, the annual congregational meeting, will be held on Sunday, February 7th. It will be at 11 a.m. by Zoom, and we would ask you to pre-register for that so that we know who's attending. We do need a quorum. It's a, an official meeting, and if, you, if and when you register, you will be rewarded with some Presbyterian pastries that will be delivered to you. So I encourage you highly to register for that meeting and attend it on February 7th. Thir the third announcement is the 21-day challenge. That is the 21-day racial justice challenge. It will be starting on February 1st, which, it, which begins Black History Month. And for more info on that, you can go to the website, fpcsouthhold.org, and see what it's all about. You can find it under the Matthew 25 tab. And lastly, there will be a Bible study focusing on Matthew 25 and themes of Lent. It will be on, at 7 p.m. on Zoom, and the link will be sent out prior to each session. The dates are Wednesdays, February 10th, February 24th, March 10th, and March 24th. You only need your Bible, so please join us. Now, wherever you are on your journey of life and faith, please know we welcome you and affirm you, and we hope you find this worship meaningful. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome from sunny Florida. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it together. Please join me in the call to worship. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From God alone comes my salvation. God, God alone is our, our rock, rock and, and salvation. salvation. We, we shall, shall never, never be shaken. Be shaken. Let, Let us worship, worship God. God.
We are invited into our time of confession. We are invited into a time of peace, of being restored and being renewed by the grace of our Savior Christ in penitence and faith. Let us join together in our prayer. Loving God, we are sorry that we become so engrossed with ourselves and our worldly matters. We do not give time to consider why you made us who we are and placed us where we are. Sometimes we feel that our affairs are too trivial to bring before you, yet we realize that we are part of your kingdom, that you created us and have a purpose for us. By your mercy, give us a wider vision so that in you we may find our true selves and the reason for our being. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear and remember the good news and the words of Paul who said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. By Christ's obedience is our disobedience wiped clean. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Testament lesson is Psalm 62 verses 5 through 12. I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender and I shall never be defeated. My salvation and honor depend on God. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. Trust in God at all times my people. Tell him all your troubles, for he is our refuge. Human beings are all like a puff of breath, great and small alike, are worthless. Put them on the scale and they weigh nothing. They are lighter than a mere breath. Don't put your trust in violence. Don't hope to gain anything by robbery. Even if your riches increase, don't depend on them. More than once I have heard God say that power belongs to him and that his love is constant. You yourself, O oh Lord, reward everyone according to their deeds. Now I invite the children and young people, whomsoever you may be, to join me here for the Sermon on the Steps. Thank you. You've probably seen these before. You probably have one of these in your house. I keep these around in case they come in handy for carrying things back and forth. Plus, now they cost five cents, so they're worth keeping around. If you could only put in this bag things you own, what would you put in it? If you had to choose from all of the things that you have that would only fit in this bag, what would go in here? There's a children's story called Benjamin Brody's Backyard Bag. And Benjamin doesn't have a briefcase like his mom and dad, and Benjamin doesn't have a, a school bag like his bigger sister, and his backpack wore out, so he has a brown bag, and he wants to be like everybody else. But he gets creative. He uses his brown bag as a garage for his um, matchbox cars. He uses his brown bag as a tablecloth for a picnic outside. And he also uses his brown bag to carry his rock collection. One day, Benjamin went on a walk with his mother. And on the walk, um, Benjamin 
met also a lady who used a brown bag for her things. And Benjamin realizes that the lady's bag has everything that she owns. And very slowly and thoughtfully, Benjamin realizes that this person is a person who doesn't have a home. And so she even shared with Benjamin a special thing from her bag and gave it to him. On his way home, Benjamin asked his mom what they could do to be of help to people who have no homes. And his mom said, why don't you use your brown bag as a list and make a list of things we can do to make life better for people who don't have any homes. So right away, before they even got home, Benjamin's brown bag became even more useful and he loved it even more. That's Benjamin Brody's brown bag. And now, we can't do everything, right? There are some things that we just can't do to make the world better. We may not have enough money or influence or the certain gifts or graces or skills we need, but each of us can do something, right? Benjamin found something he could do. Each of us has that ability. Jesus helps us figure out how we can make the world a better place and how we can help people. Like maybe you know, I'm just making this up because Jesus can show you the way, but maybe you know somebody who didn't come to school yesterday because they were ill or sick. You can make a card for them and send it to them in the mail. Use your own creative talent and your love. There's always something we can do, however small, to make the world a better place and to help people because that's what Jesus likes us to do. What do we do now? That's right, we pray. Put your hands together, close your eyes, take a nice deep breath, and let it out nice and slowly. Thank you, God, for this moment. Thank you that even though we're apart, we are always together, and we have this together time. Be with us and guide us and show us how each of us can do one small thing to make the world a better place and to help someone who is also your child. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. The New Testament reading is 1 Corinthians, verses 29 through 31. What I mean, my friends, is this. There is not much time left. And from now on, married people should live as though they were not married. Those who weep as though they were not sad. Those who laugh as though they were not happy, those who buy as though they did not own what they bought, those who deal in material goods as though they were not fully occupied with them, for this world as it is now will not last much longer. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. I heard a story from another pastor about a member of their church. This member was one of the most ambitious people the pastor had ever met. In just a decade, through his hard work and unwavering commitment, this man moved from being a truck driver for a company he worked for to owning the business, supervising hundreds of truck drivers. Then he began buying up other businesses until he was one of the wealthiest people in the community. In his 40s, however, he was struck by a terrible disease. Doctors told him he didn't have long to live. And then, wonder of wonders, he got better. After he emerged from the hospital, he called the pastor. Preacher, God has taught me a lesson, he said. The pastor said, you're not saying that you think God caused your illness, do you? I'm not exactly saying that God caused my illness, pastor, but God allowed my illness to teach me an important lesson. What was that, he asked. When I was lying up there in the hospital fighting for my life, I didn't waste one minute thinking about my businesses. I didn't miss going to the office. I didn't give a thought to all the business deals we were working on. They all seemed, in my condition, like a bunch of nothing. All I did do was think about my wife and my children. I also thought about my life and how I spent my life working for stuff that in the end, was unimportant. 
I'm not the person you knew before. I'm not living the same life I had before. And he went on to talk about all the changes he was going to make in his new life. He was going to start using his talent to help other people and not merely to make money for himself and his family. Now, he wasn't a different person than he was before. He had the same name. He had the same family. On the other hand, it was as if he had been moved to a whole new world. No doubt you're wondering and you're asking yourselves after hearing what Jane Riley just read from 1 Corinthians, what is Paul saying here about those who have no wives act as though they had none? Jane Riley actually had to talk to me before she read the scripture so she could understand what she was reading. The question is valid. And in fact, I've had a few men in my office for just that reason, acting as if they had no wife when they did. Take that a minute. Paul did not have much interest in marriage. If you look at the length and the breadth of his letters, he really doesn't have much good to say about marriage either. So that's not the point here. I think Paul is saying that knowing that in Christ, the old age has ended and a new age is beginning. We are to loose some of those things that upset and consume us, like the wealthy businessman whose life was turned upside down. Those who buy something should be like people without possessions. Those who use the world for their advantage should be like people who aren't preoccupied with the world because the world in its present form is passing away, Paul says. In Jesus Christ, a world has ended. And in Jesus Christ, a new world has begun right here under our feet. Once Christ comes into your life, and as soon as you start to see the truth about things, the way God is active in the world, bringing human history to a conclusion, you can't live the same life. You could live the same life, but it would be harder. Your life is transformed. Everything is turned upside down. And suddenly, certain things that you never saw come into focus. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis's classic, Mere Christianity. If you've never picked it up, it's a good read. He says this, Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and doesn't seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, and he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Everything gets transformed. So the question isn't to conclude with these words of Paul that we should withdraw from the world and be fully engaged with ourselves only. The question is, how do we live in the world now that Christ has come? How do we live in the world now that Christ has come, is continuing, and will come among us? And we're asking this question during a time when, literally, the present form of the world is passing away. You know it, and I know it. We're living it. Look at the changes we've been able to make to continue to worship together and engage mission in this new reality. But basic human needs have not and will not change. There are still five things every human being will be eternally concerned about. Spirituality. We have different words for it now. It used to be called prayer. Now it's called mindfulness, meditation. Human beings have a primal interest in spirituality that we can help with and provide. Relationships. How do I get along in my relationships? Scripture, the church, the teachings of Christ have things to say about relationships. Finances. 
How do I get along with the instrument we call money in the world? Same thing. We have things that we can provide. There will be a Financial Peace University offered virtually very soon. Number four, vocation. A uh, principal question Presbyterians ask themselves is what am I called to be and do in the world? Not just pastors have callings, we all have a calling. That's our vocation. How are we to be in the world? And lastly, stewardship of life, health. How am I to take care of the gift of this life that I've been given? These five questions are eternal questions that the church has and can continue to answer no matter the circumstances. When Paul uses the word time in 1 Corinthians, it's the same use of the word that Mark uses in the other lectionary reading in Mark chapter 1. Time is fulfilled. Time is fulfilled. That's the word kairos in Greek, not chronos, kairos. Kairos means God's appointed time, not time according to a watch, time according to the heart, time according to the soul. That's the time we're in right now as a church. Mission has changed. We've gone from a global and regional to a much more local focus. We're not thinking so much anymore about attendance and numbers. We're thinking about qualitative experiences. We're going from teaching to equipping. We're going from counting attendance to engagement. If you engage with something in this congregation, the goal is to help you take that next step, whatever that next step is going to be. That's the new territory that we're occupying now. We're going from complexity to simplicity. Flat, open source permission giving. We are going to be experimenting every single day. And yes, some of those experiments will lead to failure. And those failures, hopefully, will lead to learning. That's the new territory we are occupying in this new time. So, are you ready to be the kind of church that does something that makes the world stand up and realize that we have something that is not in the world? I am. Let's go. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe in God who bends and kneels toward our world, drenching it in love, making it new with every breath. We believe in Jesus, God becomes human, who brought every person a spark of the divine. We believe in the spirit, hovering God, present among us, abiding, upholding, awakening all things to God's grace. We believe we are called to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God and each other, ready for God's reign, awake and alert as we work to bring it near. This we promise to do in the name and spirit of Christ. Amen. Let us join together in our prayer. Let us pray. There is a time to be born and a time to die, and this is a time to be born. So we turn to you, God of our life, God of all our years, God of our beginning. Our times are in your hand. So hear us today as we pray. For those of us with too much into obedience, birth us to the freedom of the gospel. For those of us too much into self-indulgence, birth us into the discipleship of your ministry. For those too much into cynicism, birth us to the innocence of the Christ child. For those of us too much into cowardice, birth us to the courage to stand before principalities and powers. For those of us too much into guilt, birth us into forgiveness worked in your generosity. For those of us too much into despair, Birth us into the promises you make to your people. For those of us too much into control, birth us into the vulnerability of the cross. For those of us too much into fatigue, birth us into the energy of Pentecost. 
we dare pray that you will do for us and among us and through us what is needful for newness for this day. We make this prayer not only for ourselves, but for all of our communities, for our schools, for our church at the edge of life, for our South Old Town waiting for newness, the whole nation, the whole creation with which we yearn in eager longing. There is a time to be born, and it is now. We sense the pangs and groans of your newness coming upon us, and so we invite you, come, Lord Jesus, be our light, and hear us as we give back to you the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Eddie Ward. I'm a member of the Stewardship and Finance Committee. And I just wanted to say a few words about why we do what we do, why we have the pledge drive and these generosity jingles and why we all give. And that's for the community outreach. Our church is really an important part of the community. We do so much to help. So for example, we've, we've just built and we're maintaining a free pantry for people in need. We cook, um, I think it's every other week, we're cooking hot meals, preparing and cooking hot meals for people in need. We have, um, and we have our deacons who are providing financial assistance to people in need throughout the community. So we appreciate uh, what you give to the church and those are some of the things that, that we, we do with it. Good evening, I'm Jim Baker. I chair your building and grounds committee. <clears throat> Peter Kelly explained to me when I first came on board that the church's facilities are a ministry itself that support our many other ministries. Lately, our grounds have provided a wonderful place to conduct our outdoor worship services. But even before that, think of car washes and other outdoor spiritual, educational, and fundraising activities that have happened on our property. Moving indoors, of course, our sanctuary, Christian Ed building, the manses, and the barn all provide platforms from which to conduct our many ministries that support the mission of our church. These buildings must be well maintained and in good repair if they are to continue to serve. We have inherited these structures from our forebears. I believe it's our duty to use them thoroughly but wisely and then pass them on to our heirs in a better condition than when we received them. So today I just wanted to let you know that some of your generosity is being directed towards this very important effort. And I wanna say thank you so very much. Hi everybody, I'm Peter Kelly. I have the happy position of being your pastor, which means that I get to be in the office sometimes or answering the phone sometimes when one of you comes in having experienced some sort of um, gift uh, that you wanna share. Some people um, come into some resources and they wanna tithe it. And uh, I am regularly overwhelmed and humbled by the generosity of people coming in and wanting to share, wanting to direct a financial gift in some, in some way that is just a, a joyous surprise. Uh, I get to read the emails when, for instance, um, people in need reach out to the deacons, uh, persons in need. And I get to see the, uh, the generous responses from the deacons who are always in favor of um, helping out as much as they can. And uh, how many of you give to the deacons so that they can be generous out there in the community. So it's just a, it's a selfish joy that I experience watching people come in and share and give and surprise us frankly with some of the resources and financial gifts that they make. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Walter Geiper. I'm part of the Stewardship and Finance Committee. Uh, I just want to share a little saying that actually hangs on my door as I leave the house every day, which I think really kind of identifies our church family and leads to the generosity that everyone shares. And it, what it is is a little happiness saying. And it says, when one's spiritual needs are met by an untroubled inner life, happiness comes when your words and deeds 
are the benefit of yourself and others. And I think that is a good example of our church family and I hope it brightens everybody's day. Thank you. Hi everybody. As you can see from right there, I'm David Dickerson and I too am on the Stewardship and Finance Committee. And having heard about some of the things that uh, the church does with the money that you so generously give, I thought I'd remind you of the different ways that we try to make it easy for you to give to the church. First off, you can go on to the church's website, click the online giving button and make a donation either through a credit card or PayPal. Next, this is relatively new, but you can download the Give Plus app. And through that app, you can set up a one-time payment or weekly or monthly uh, payments. And that's an, a good way from the church's standpoint because your donation automatically flows through into the church's system. So nothing gets lost in the shuffle. Uh, thirdly, you can have your bank set up an automatic withdrawal and they can do that again, recurring weekly or monthly or however you want it. Or finally, you can do it like it's always been done and send in the check or drop checks off at the office. Uh, however you give, it's appreciated and we thank you for it. Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Compassionate Father, thank you that you are our strength and our song. You fill our hearts with joy. May we give our offerings to you with gladness and joy. Everything we have belongs to you, and we rejoice to give some of your abundant gifts back to you. Bless the tithes and offering we give today. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us, the compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us, and the presence of the Spirit be the power that empowers us all. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, as we come to the conclusion of this experience of worship, as I love to remind you, whether you've experienced this by yourself or surrounded by loved ones, you are a part of this communion of believers and an indispensable part of the body of Christ. Go in peace 
Take what truth you may have heard with you into life. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that will never let you go, and the abiding comfort and presence of the Holy Spirit remain and abide with all God's people. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen, my friends. Until next time.